Oh, hi there. Welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show, episode number 174, with me, your host, Agostino Zynga. How the hell are you doing, motherfuck? Hope you guys are well, rested, hydrated, lubricated, limbered. <laughs> and yeah, wherever you are around the world, around the country, around the interwebs, I hope you guys are doing okay. You guys and gals or whatever else in between, if there's some dog listening, big up there's some cats fuck off i don't like you guys but i hope you guys are okay and you're feeling good i'm feeling amazing i'm feeling fresh i've got my little mug of coffee here if you're watching it via youtube if you're watch, if you're listening via podcast app you're gonna hear me drinking this said coffee <sighs> is there anything more annoying than people that drink coffee like that or drink any sort of beverage like that like no that sound is so annoying isn't it um Again, I, I, I've, I've always had the idea in my head, anyway, that people that do that sort of stuff are just doing it for attention. It's not really how they actually drink. It's just, you know, you know how people like, you know, there's some adults that um, like having um, a little a little um, kook they give themselves, right? A little, um, you know, a little weird thing that they do. Like, oh, I'm just so crazy. You know, they, they have this thing that they give themselves to make themselves more interesting. It's not something that they intrinsically do or instinctively do. It's just something that they started to do in their, I don't know, when, I don't know. If you pick up a habit, not even habit. If you pick up a little tick, right, on purpose over the age of twenty-one, you know, like you gotta give your head a wobble. You gotta give your head a big old side to side, backward and forward wobble. Not the kind of Bollywood wobble. Not the kind of like you know that Indian wobble when you're talking and that. No, not that kind. A real wobble, like just to make sure that everything is going okay in there. Like imagine like being an actual adult and giving yourself a little tick that you got like. Oh. When I get drunk, I just do this thing all the time. No, you don't do this thing all the time. You're doing it all the time because your friends keep laughing at it. And it's the thing that you do. There was a there was a person in my group of friends who will go unnamed, um, who I always used to get annoyed by. Like secretly used to fucking it used to make my blood boil. Whenever we'd be out and stuff, this person, um, whenever they saw a dog, would like run across the road and and like, go pet a dog. Oh my god, it's a dog! It's a dog! Like they get freaked out and like it's about a dog and and some people in the group are like, oh my god, that, isn't that so cute? Right, that that person likes dogs that much. Oh, she, um, he or she is so crazy about dogs, so head over heels about it. And it, to me, it always seemed a bit disingenuous. I always like, you don't like dogs that much. No one likes dogs that much. You might like see a dog and be like, oh, sick. That's that's quite a cool breed or that's quite a cute dog, whatever. But to freak out and run across the road and, and want to pet a stranger's dog is fucking bizarre. Um, I would imagine, right, it's probably similar to, um, yeah, this this sounds weird, right? But I'd imagine it would be similar, right, if you saw like a random woman or a random guy walking across the road and happened to be in really good shape. And you decided to be like, oh my God, look at, look how strong her thighs are. Look how flat her stomach is. And you ran across the road and started touching her. I'd imagine for a dog owner, it's probably the same sort of correlation, right? When someone comes, some stranger comes and starts petting your dog. Like, what the fuck? Don't pet my fucking dog. I don't fucking know you, right? Because you have no idea if this guy's got a fucking mini blade in the back of his pocket. He's going to grab your dog by the back of his neck and just fucking, you know, run that blade from left to right all across the back under his neck. You have no idea who people are. Um, but I always thought that was a bit strange, right? That girl like running across the road and petting people's dog or freaking out any dog that was around the road. It's like, relax, like, take it easy. And again, I think that's one of those ticks you just, you pick up and you give yourself like, oh, I've got this tick where, you know, I just can't get enough of dog. When I see a dog, I just freak out. It's like, no, you don't. You don't. You don't. You're, you're a grown up. You're a bit mayonnaise. You're a bit vanilla. You're a bit boring. So you pick up a little tick, a tick to make yourself go crazy. Um, it's like girls who get themselves purposely flat out drunk, right? So they can act a fool. Because, you know, they don't really have much personality, you know? So they have to get wasted on fucking Rosé in order for you to kind of see, for them to be kind of funny in their own eyes. But, you know, have you ever tried hanging around girls when they're smashed and you're not? Oof. I know, I know, I know for sure there's girls out there that'll be saying, oh, but I guess, you know, you don't understand, man. Like, have you ever tried being a girl hanging around the boys that are, that are drunk? I get it, right? It might be annoying as well. Probably as an You'd be as annoying? Boys, like, you know, beating their chest, acting like gorillas. Maybe same level, I think. Maybe the same level, right? Because I'm just thinking about a gaggle of women, right? You know that kind of high pitch, high screech, like they're all kind of competing to tell their own story. Um, there's there's little, you know how girls are. There's always weird little kind of inner beefs going on that no one really speaks about. People are trying to assert dominance. Someone's trying to talk about their boyfriend for the 17th million time. Someone's trying to talk about their holiday. Someone's trying to talk about the, the, the boss that they don't like. Like it's just constant drama right that's happening in that conversation and they're all drunk too so you know when you're drunk you don't really have a good sense of uh, self right you, know, you don't really um 
You don't really, you can't really, you know, check your P's and Q's. You're not, you're not Sergio Busquets out here, right? You're a bit Scott Parkery, right? You've got, you've got vision, but you just can't do, your body just can't do what your mind wants to do. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. It's just something that's always annoyed me in that regard. But anyway, regardless of that, welcome to the show. I know it was a bit of a strange intro, but you know, it's always good to have a strange intro on podcasts. That's the way podcasts are. They're designed to allow people like myself to get on a microphone, rant and rave about things that don't really make any sense and that no one will probably care about in order for it to not cloud my head and for me to not um, suffer from some sort of psychotic breakdown. Not that it's not going to happen, but I'm hoping it doesn't. Anyway, welcome back to the show. I just got back from a fucking strenuous workout. So much I had to stop like a quarter of the way through. I was meant to do four to five 1,000 meter repeats. I did three. Um, I just couldn't handle to do the fourth. My body was absolutely battered. And, and like I mentioned previously, like running, man. Oh, it's fucking tiring as fuck. But as per usual, it's the only thing that I've seen that's kind of really got the weight off me. Or really like stripped the fat off of me. Like now I'm already down. I think I'm just, I think I'm sub 220 now, which is good. So I'm kind of heading in the right direction. I kind of want to get to about 210 maybe or, or close enough to 210 by the end of the month. It's going to be a bit of a stretch to do. But if I'm dieting well and I'm working out a lot and plus, you know, I've got a pretty stock. I've got a pretty locked in schedule, which always helps when you're dieting or when you're trying to work out. It's always good to have like a really rigid schedule that you can kind of work around and then you can kind of make sure that you hit those days you want to work out. So I'm, I'm, I'm at work Monday to Friday. Um, I'm DJing basically from next week until the end of the month. And damn, yeah, I've got nothing else on basically, like going away or whatever, holidays or trips or anything, all that sort of malarkey. Um, probably, we're probably going to have a big birthday dinner thing, some steaks and whatever, um, eat some food, have some good times. And that might be the only kind of situation about going out. But for the rest of it, I'm kind of, I'm kind of locked in. So that's going to allow me to, you know, uh, commit to like a, a healthy, I, I try and do the healthy diet thing Monday to Friday. I, do, I would say I'll do it Monday to Saturday, but it's quite hard to do Monday to Saturday because, you know, Sunday comes around, you just want to lay around and just watch Netflix and eat shit. So, I, but I try to like, you know, I try to have it Saturday cheat day and then Sunday, maybe a cheat breakfast. And then from the dinner onwards, try and kind of, you know, rein it back in again in order to start the Monday off again. Because I don't want to like, you know, have ice cream and donuts and shit in my belly um, on Sunday night rolling into Monday. I kind of want to stop the, the shit eating maybe on Sunday afternoon and then kind of start eating healthy from there. So it's going to allow me to do it. And again, it's a, it's a challenge. It's something that's going to probably take a lot of effort to do, a lot of working out. But I'm eager to accept the challenge and see if I can hit about 210. Because when I, when I hit 210... When I hit like sub 220 is when people can see that I'm obviously losing weight. Like my weight starts to pull up because I get, I guess I got like a bigger frame. So whenever you start to lose weight um, with the frame that I got, it's a bit more, it's easier to see because, you know, because my frame is big. So you just, you, the frame is still there, but the the waist um, and the insides are a bit loose. And I can even tell trousers I'm wearing already that the weight is falling off. So, but yeah, the running thing is difficult. Say I did 1,000, well, 1,000 meter repeats. Um, it's quite good though, the area that I live in because the where I am around the corner, there's a little, a little block thing that I can run around a little like, um, it's meant to be like a little, um, I think they're going to make it into a parky, greeny thing. But it's essentially like a massive rectangle. And I think one lap is essentially... One lap? One lap is about 800 metres. Yeah, 800 metres. Yeah, just under 800 metres maybe. Or 700... No, let's say 700 metres. Yeah, one lap is 700 metres. So it's quite a big little um, thing to kind of go around. So I did about... I think it's... Well, a thousand, a thousand metres is probably one lap and a, and a quarter. Um, so I did that this morning and it was just brutal, brutal. Because of course I'm trying to keep a steady pace... I managed to get, I managed to do two laps of that, uh, like a sub 720 mile, which was really good for me. And I think the first one was really slow. It was about 758, just under eight minutes. But the second two were like under 720, which was really, really quick. And again, it's going back to my normal pace I used to run previously. When I used to run before, I used to always run like a 720, 740, 720, 740 mile. That's been my standard thing. And I think it just looks nicer when you're running across. It just looks more professional. You know what I mean? When you're seeing someone running down the street. So it's, I always get a bit sad, right? When you're walking down the street and you see someone jogging in the morning and they're like, you know, uh, 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 they're, they're rocking left to right. They're, 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 their feet are slamming on the on the concrete. It, there's just no um, form, function, rhythm, tempo to their form of running. It's just, you know, and it kind of defeats the purpose. Um, I always kind of have the addict of like um, Pavel Tatsulin, right? The, um, the kettlebell workout dude. He said something along the lines of like, you should never be working out to max rep or max like, you know, you should never strain yourself to the end, right? You should kind of operate between, I think it says that like 60 to 80% of your maximum. 
that's that's how you get a good workout. Like try and hit those really well instead of trying to hit like the max weight, which goes back to uh, John Warborn quote or someone along those kind of lines, something along the lines of um, don't look for harder workouts, work really hard on the workouts you already have, right? Like try and push yourself as much as you can. Don't try and look for the other thing, which is what a lot of people do. Isn't it? The people that don't really know how to work out want to get involved. Like oh, what do I do? What do I do? It's like doesn't really matter what you do. Just go on men's health, pick any of those. 30 day lose weight get a six pack program whatever they are pick one program and just keep doing it again and again and again like I, that's what i do now I, I still use the same men's health um weightlifting um or power is it strength building um routine that i found ages ago and i just basically have tweaked it around here and there you know added reps took take away reps uh, pull squats whatever it may be um that's what basically what i use and then just use that and just push them as much as you can it's, ne- it's not necessarily the workout that's the problem. It's the application of the workout. So, same with the diet, really. Diet isn't really an issue. It's just to commit to one. Pick one. Pescatarian, ke- keto, um, intermittent fasting, paleo, whatever. Just pick one and just stick with it for 30 days and see how you feel and then rinse and repeat. Um, that's basically what to do. But I guess, you know, us human beings want instant results. But anyway, enough about that. Let's rock on into the topics. I've got a bunch to talk about here. ba 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 Okay. Number one, this um, Moisey Keen um, backlash is happening, right? So, um, if you're not familiar, um, Moisey Keen is a young Juventus striker. I'm pretty sure he's of Ivorian, Ivory Coast um, descendant, but um, he represents um, Italy. He, re- he recently had his made his debut for the, the national team, the senior squad. I think he scored in his debut too. Um, the person he is generally seen as like a, a new, like young, hot prospect. Everyone's talking about him. He's somebody that a lot of people have a lot of high hopes for. But I got to be honest, when I first saw him play for Italy, my, the first thing that did strike my head was like, oh, I'm surprised I haven't heard of this guy, right? Because I watch quite a lot of football. And secondly, um, I was always like, I was also like, oh, I'm surprised I haven't heard anything that's concerning um, racial abuse. And that's a bad, that's a really sad thing for me to think about. But unfortunately, in Italy... Um, racial abuse doesn't seem to have the same kind of stigma that it does maybe in the UK or other parts of Europe. It seems as if some Italian fans or some Italian supporters or people within the football industry there, they see racial abuse as just another end of the stick when it comes to winding up players, right? When they're whistling, when they're jeering, they say things about your family, things that, you know, sometimes can um, cross the line. I think some Italian supporters in their warped thinking have this idea that monkey noises, throwing bananas, or whatever it may be, or just jeering at, um, excessively when a black player touches the ball. Some, some fans are a little bit more savvy. They don't do monkey noises, but they, they scream and whistle excessively when someone touches the ball, right? That happens to be black. Um, they just see that as part and parcel of what they do. So I was surprised when I didn't hear anything concerning Mo- Mosey Keane, but then I thought, you know what? Maybe, I, in my naive brain, I thought, maybe um, it's, we, we've got to a better place now. The Italians have now basically seen that, you know, he's one of theirs. Essentially, he is an Italian. Um, it might not be um, advantageous for them to kind of be um, directing racial abuse to him, especially if he's going to play for the national team and they want him to score loads of goals. So I thought maybe they kind of had, you know, they would be like, oh, I thought maybe my walk thinking, you know, I honestly thought, I thought maybe they would continue um, directing racial abuse at people who weren't Italian and just leave their own alone. That's what I thought in my head. And now, of course, I was um, uh, this. I was absolutely wrong, because unfortunately, this episode happened the other day where um, it's um, Juventus were facing Calgary, and I guess for the most part, um, from what I've been reading online, Calgary is the one place where a lot of players do get a lot of racial abuse. I think I read somewhere that uh, that's that was maybe one of the places where Suleiman Tari got into that epic. Got into that. Um, I if you remember, there was a, a the time where Suleiman Tari was really annoyed with someone was saying some racial abuse to him, and he was threatening to leave the pitch, and he was arguing with people on the pitch. There's a famous video of him kind of like, you know, um, scuffling with somebody near the pitch. But that's what it's supposed to be meant to happen. So I shouldn't be that surprised with this happening there. But I thought I'd kind of talk about it and kind of play the video and see what the kind of overall uh, backlash has been regarding the whole situation. But let's get it up on here. Let's switch this around. Da, 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 da. Hold on. Stop there. So the guys. So um, Moji Keen's getting abuse uh, away from home at Calgary. He's getting absolute pelters from the Calgary fans. And you know, as luck would have it, uh, or as you know, fortune favors the bold, or uh, as um, the higher ups would deem it, um, he, he he's having a bit of a. He's he's getting a dog dogs dogs abuse from the Calgary fans. It's one nil. And as luck would have it, he happens to score the winning goal or the second goal that kind of steals the victory for Juventus. 
and then he celebrates like this right and this is a, it's up here on the screen now and if you guys aren't can't if you're not watching it then you'll probably hear it now in the background he essentially celebrates in front of the calgary fans and just stands there with his arms out wide looking at them deadpan absolutely amazing celebration in my opinion great 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 celebration his players are trying to push him back telling him to chill out um, take it easy. Um, some Calgary supporters are, are telling the fans to not stop jeering him, stop racial abuse. Um, I forgot who this French player's name is. He's arguing with his manager, uh, Allegri. It's just an absolute shit show of a situation. Absolute shit show. But again, it just goes to show, right? And this kid, how old is he? 19 years old, right? 19 years old Italian. Um, getting his dog's, dog's abuse, right? Um, da, 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 da. So... Again, I'm, I'm just not too. I'm just not too sure what the solution is for something like this because it seems like it seems like Italy just doesn't get it. They're not. They just don't. They're not. Um, I wouldn't even say it's a woke thing. They just don't get it. It's just not a thing that um it, it come. It kind of um it kind of um it's just not something they kind of resonate with. They don't actually get the the significance of it, or maybe they do, and that's why they do it to kind of put you off your game. But I generally think for them, it's more of an issue of like um. They're trying to put you off your game, which is fucking disgusting to think that they think that's acceptable, right? To put you off your game to something like that. A 19 year old Italian kid who's representing his own country, wearing your colors on your chest, right? That badge on your chest, scoring goals, celebrating excessively. It just doesn't make any sense. And I just don't know what the right um, solution is for it, right? But what I do know, the right, the, what I do know for one thing is that the, the wrong solution is to come out and say what Bonucci said, right? So Bonucci um, uh, is a you know, a defender for Juventus, you know, one of the, maybe one of the world's highly rated defenders. People think he's probably one of the best out there. Um, he comes out and says the following because, you know, Benucci thinks, you know, he has all the answers. Uh, Benucci Keen, let me see what the actual quote was. So I can, no, I don't want to no, not quote him, misquote him, sorry. Um, so essentially, um, um, Leonardo Bucci, I, f I think Benucci came out because I think that particular game he was celebrating his 2050th appearance, right? But essentially, he comes out and says the following, which I think is like a, uh, it kind of represents exactly the kind of idiosity, id, id, idiosity you'd see from most um, uh, fans in Italy when it comes to this, right? Uh, where is it? Blah, 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 blah. Where are you here? Yeah, so um, here's this quote from Bellucci, right? He comes after the game is finished. And this is an article from uh, Sports Bible, right? So it says the following. Let me get it up here. Da, 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 da. Benucci was one of the players who came over to Keen, pulling him away as he stood for celebrating in front of the Calgary Ultras with his arms outstretched. Okay, so it was Calgary Ultras that I was saying. So it wasn't the entire stadium, but still, you know, absolute scumbags. And the Ultras are the ones that kind of turn up to your house and kind of, you know, shout things as you're sleeping and shit and demand meetings of you outside your front door. It's fucking bizarre behavior. Anyway, um, in his post-match interview, the Juventus centre-back who opened the scoring for the match was critical of his teammates' actions, right? Imagine, you're the black player... 19 years old, playing for Juventus, you represent your country, it, which happens to be Italy, um, you're getting dogs abuse from the Calgary fans, they turn into racial abuse, you score the winning goal, the, two, the, the second goal to kind of kill the game, in front of the Calgary fans, you celebrate, but just opening your arms at stretch, it's like, now what? Now what? Yeah, you just look at them deadpan, and then your fellow teammate, um, the leader of your team says that in a, in a post-match press conference, he says the following: instead of you know um, uh, uh, abolishing the Calgary fans and saying what they were doing was disgusting, he says the following: he knows that when he scores a goal, he has to focus on celebrating with his teammates. He knows he could have done something differently too. That's just, this is like akin to Trump, right? When he when um, the whole um, Antifa and whatever thing happened, and the and the guy drove his car into the crowd, end up killing somebody, right? He's like, oh, there's there's and there's bad people on both sides, both sides, right? What the fuck are you talking about? Um, he, he wouldn't he wouldn't admonish um white supremacy. It's kind of a similar sort of statement, like what the fuck are you talking about? There's only one right answer here, right? And it's just the easy one. It's the lowest hanging fruit. Um, there were racist jeers after the goal. Uh, Blaze heard it and was angered. I think the blame is fifty fifty. Blaze Matuidi heard it fifty fifty. That what the fuck are you talking about? So we're antagonizing these people now. We're making them say racist shit. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? Because Moises shouldn't have done that. And the uh, curver should not have reacted that way. We are professionals. We have to set the example and not provoke anyone. Like, Benucci, fuck you. What the fuck is this guy talking about? Not provoke anyone. So this is akin to like him saying, imagine you're Robinho, right? Robinho playing for Sao Paulo, right? Back in the day when you said, is this Sao Paulo or Santos? Whatever. When Robinho was like, you know, 
one million step overs, um, doing fucking Rabonas, right? Do you know what I mean? Like just absolutely taking the piss out of players, right? There was a theory in Brazil, it happens a lot even still now, where if you do that too often, you embarrass a the player, they'll kick you, right? They'll kick you, they'll smash you, they'll, I don't know, they'll just push you up, you know, they'll push you up the fucking pitch. They'll be violent, right? Don't embarrass me on TV, no problem. But you wouldn't expect them, if you wouldn't expect if you nut somebody, if you nut make them, right, flick the ball over their head, for them to then suddenly start calling you, um, right, to start referring to you in racial slurs, right, in order to kind of get back at you. That's not the way you go, right? When somebody, um, when you're having an argument with somebody and the first thing they go towards is a racial slur, that indicates that some, this person, there's, some, there's something not quite right going on in their melon, right? When the first thing they run to is a racial slur, there's nothing, you're not quite right there in the head. So for him to decide that, you know, with all this stuff happening, the first thing the fans you should go to is like, well, 50-50, you know, you don't provoke the, the fans. I scored the goal and I celebrate. How am I provoking them when they were doing those racist chants before I scored the goal? How is that a provo provocation? Like, get the fuck out of here. Um, if anything, if I was Mosey Keen, I would have scored the goal, walked to the middle of the pitch and then walked off the pitch. Game over. I'm done. I'm over it. That's what I would have done. Scored the winning goal, walked to the pitch and walked off the pitch and just had my middle fingers up to the crowd. Like, just like that, Jamie, just... Ah, ah, ah. that would have been excellent score a goal celebrate like that walk back to the center circle kick off and then walk off the pitch done um since um he made those comments remarks many have supported the fact that Keane stood up for racist supporters including Raheem Sterling and Mario Bellatelli while many slammed Benucci's post-match conference and of course um Sterling came as a the blame is 50 50 but it was actually Benucci started laughing all you can do now is laugh at Benucci and then the other one 24 hours after his outburst the Italian defender has not issued a statement seeking to clarify 24 hours I want to clarify my feelings oh yeah you want to clarify them you fucking prick yesterday I was interviewed right after the game and I was it doesn't matter after the game just say the right thing imagine you being in a stadium we're fans right we see it from TV imagine being in a stadium and hearing monkey chants right um and it's only directed at your fellow teammate happens to be black and he's 19 years old so you're the you're the senior state you're the senior a statesman in your in your team you are the leader you probably have your arm around him you're probably giving him advice on how to conduct himself in this game you can you kind of have a you kind of have a connection with this kid right because he's a young dude who came up from the from the squad i think maybe from the youth team and you and you're kind of seeking to kind of you know help him out and then you hear that what the crowd is saying you should be more angry than we are because that's your teammate that's your guy that's your soldier that's one of your people that you die for on the football pitch and yet you come out and say that and now for 24 24 hours now all of a sudden everything is clear Oh, football players shouldn't ever talk really for the most part. Most of them, anyway. There's nothing going on in that head, isn't it? Yesterday, I was interviewed right after the end of the game, and my words have been clearly misunderstood. No, they weren't misunderstood. You said what you said, you fucking prick. Oh, probably because I was too hasty in the way I expressed my thoughts. Hours and years wouldn't be enough to talk about a sub subject. Yeah, they wouldn't, but in that interview, the easiest thing to say the Calgary fans were way out of line. I don't, I don't, I don't support any kind of racial abuse, and I stand with my teammate Mosey Keane. Done. Like you don't have to go that far. We don't, we don't need a fucking TED talk. We don't need you to fucking be Martin Luther King. We don't need that. Just you know, that was abhorrent. What the Calgary fans did it was disgusting. I hope the officials are watching. I hope this punishment has been made. Uh, Mosey Keane um, cursed himself in the best way possible. He answered. It, he silenced the crowd. I'm standing with the, my teammate. Whatever. Just a simple statement, and then he comes out. Oh, fit, blame him for 50 50 on either side. Fuck you. Hours and years will be enough. It's made me so angry. It's so stupid. Uh, abuses are not acceptable at all this. And then that he's got is and look at the picture he posts of, of him and Keen on his Instagram. He doesn't post a picture of him pulling him away from the fucking crowd, like, oh stop doing that. He posts a picture of him and him at the at the fucking international thing. Like, ah, fuck off. In the aftermath, the events manager Allegri said that he, he should there should be a lifetime ban handed down to the fans. He scored another goal and did it better in the second half, whereas we got more or less everything wrong in the first half. I didn't hear anything from the stands as I was focused on the game. I love him because man. This is, I didn't hear anything. It was a classic Aswing thing. I didn't hear anything. I didn't see anything. I spilled a question when that um um that was crazy. I spilled a question with the whole um Kepa and Sari thing. What happened? I, I didn't see it. You're the captain. You didn't see it. You're standing right there. You play right back. Like, what the fuck are you talking about? You're standing right there. I didn't see nothing. Okay. I didn't hear it. I didn't see it in the stands. I was focused on the game. Imagine being that focused that you can't hear what the chance in the stadium is. It's fucking bullshit. You need a great intelligence to deal with these situations. should not go to provoke people. What? That, of course, does not mean that idiots in the crowd. Like, what does that even mean, provoke? Like, what is this provocation about? How is he provoking anyone? Well, by doing skills and playing well. As always in life, there are idiots who do stupid things and ruin it for everyone. I don't think anything about it at all times. I don't think anything talk. I don't think talking about it at all, all the time helps. What? I don't think 
halting play helps because not everyone said him did that. It doesn't matter if not. If you're if you're if if there's people in the crowd that are stupid enough to go in the stadium and subject players to racial abuse, the game shouldn't continue. Black players just walk off the pitch until it's dealt with properly. If they have to play behind closed doors, if the, the, the people have to get banned, because what that means is that when that keep ha- when that keeps happening, the good fans are going to get annoyed and they're going to get pissed because they're getting punished. Then they're going to police the stands. When some idiot starts making monkey noises, someone behind him is going to slap him back in the head like, oh, it's, don't do that, you fucking dickhead. Do you know what I mean? Because they're going to ban us again, right? They're going to police themselves. But it's going to take black players walking off the pitch and taking a stand for it. It doesn't matter if it inconveniences you and it stops the game and you have to forfeit it. I don't care, right? You're not going to be in a stand and hear it. You, have you been to a football game before? Have you heard? Have, do you know what it sounds like? People are chanting things that in the stand. It's ridiculous how much it puts you off your game. Like, let alone playing Sunday league. Imagine what it must be like playing in a stadium full of 30,000 plus people and half of them don't like you. Half of them want you dead because you play for another side and then add the racial element to it. It's not nice, mate. Um, for, It's just like, what the fuck is Allegri talking about? It's just, yeah, anyway, anyway. Um, crazy situation. Again, Um, I, I what do you call it? Respect to Mosey Keane. Being 19 years old, having to deal with that in Italy must be a horrible... It must be already horrible as it is being in Italy and being black and probably hanging around with loads of white players and maybe even having an Italian girlfriend or whatever it may be. It must be absolutely... It must be an old space. Like, it's like when I went to... So I kind of went to the Czech Republic. It was a nice place, don't get me wrong, but that's the, you know, you know when you forget you're black? I guess because you're so like, you know, you just have such a, we just, we just have such, we have it so well, we have it so cushy sometimes in the UK. I think that certain parts of England where you go to some, some areas that are maybe a lot more, um, you know, uh, they have a, they have a, maybe a, a whiter majority and you go there and then you get reminded of your skin color because everyone's kind of looking at you weird, right? Um, but for the most part, living in you know the main part, you know the east, living in East London and hanging around maybe South London, you don't necessarily know what your skin color is, right? You just you're just a dude. No one really gives a shit what you what color you are. Everyone's trying to just get by and do their own thing. But then you go to other countries and you're reminded of just what you look like, right? Um, or just how other people perceive you. And that's the same thing I felt when I went to Czech Republic. I was like, fuck, man! Imagine living here. People were staring at me the entire time. Like, imagine, again, it could be for whatever reason. It could fool out somebody, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Give you a reason, whatever it may be. But for the most part, they were just staring at me, right? Everyone was walking around. I was getting stared at. There's loads of tourists in Prague, especially. People go there all the time to go see the clock and go hang out and have cheap food and, and drink cheap beer. And I was the only one getting stared at. And it reminded me, like, Jesus Christ, imagine this being your life every day. Of course, I'm sure if I lived there, it wouldn't be as bad because they'd get to know you. They'd understand, okay, that's the black dude that lives around the corner. They wouldn't be so weird. They wouldn't be so freaked out about you. But it still kind of hit me like, fuck, man, it must be shit living here, isn't it? And I, I guess the same thing living in Italy, for the most part, if you're a black dude. Or, you know, it must be just a constant kind of reminder of just you're not Italian enough, right? Like when you, when you, it's like maybe you know Andy Murray. I think he may say the same thing when he says like um when he wins is British, when he loses is Scottish, right? That kind of idea. Like you're never quite good enough for them. Um, I guess for Andy Murray, it's beneficial because you know at least you have white skin. You know at least you can kind of you know look the part. Maybe when you start talking, people can tell straight away you're Scottish. But yeah, annoying and and annoying and frustrating that this is happening still in 2019, especially for a player that represents Italy, especially for somebody that's not as it's you'd. <sighs> I dare to say it, right, that you'd kind of understand if it was Balotelli, right? He's maybe a little bit more of a, you know, um, Marmite character. He maybe is a little bit more of a provocateur. He maybe is a bit more of a wind-up merchant. Even then, I still think it's unacceptable because he plays for your fucking national team. He scores goals. He's an entertaining player. And then it's just, it's, just, it's, it's fucking ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. And I'm, I'm, I hope they get punished. I'm, they probably won't because, you know, the fucking... Um, uh the calgary chairman came out and said some fucking mad shit as well uh what do you say this is a statement that calgary chairman came out and say it's just from uh, football italia got it here the calgary chairman says the following what do you say um uh giolini self-righteous about keen right Calgary President Tomas, Tommaso Giolini claims Mosey Keane abuse was not racist, as if um, if uh, Federico Bernadeschi had celebrated like that, he would have been treated exactly the same way. No, he wouldn't have, because Bernadeschi um, um, is white, mate. 
So if you were celebrating in front of the Calgary fans the same way, they would have probably said his mum's a whore. They would have probably said something about, something about his wife, his kids. That's what they would have said. The standard kind of football insult kind of, you know, um, uh, rotation. But they wouldn't have called him a monkey. They wouldn't have called him a gorilla. They wouldn't have made monkey noises. They wouldn't have done that because he's not black, you absolute spanner. Um, the 2 0 home defeat to Juventus was oversized by ugly seas after Keane's goal at 85th minute. He acted by jeers and his name aimed in direction throughout the match by celebrating the arms that stretching from the ultras. This sparked even louder than ever a clearly racist chance from that section of the crowd, which was spread to the teammates Blaise Matudi and Alexandra. If Benedetti had celebrated like that, he would have been treated exactly the same. Um, the same way by others, by our fans. If Diabala had done that, no, he wouldn't because Diabala's white. Again, you prick. Yeah, um, Diabala had the same drama queen antics after the goal uh, that Matuidi did. He would have been treated exactly the same way. Drama queen, like what? I don't want people to start bending, being self-righteous about it because I heard that already. Whereas Juventus players came to me afterwards and confessed Keen was wrong to celebrate that way. Who said that? Who? Fucking Benucci. Absolute donut. We cannot go around calling the entire Calgary crowd offensive things. No, we can't. But those ultras are racist. Can we say that? Is that all right? If the ultras are racist who happen to be in your in your in your in your stadium and I'm a black player, I can walk off because those ultras represent your fans. So that's it, right? We can't go around saying da, da, da. if they were racist jeers, then our fans got it wrong. But it happened because of the celebration. No, it didn't happen before the celebration, you prick. That's why he celebrated like that, right? Um and it wouldn't have happened even if the goal score had a different colour. All I heard were whistles and jeers, but if you with if we were to yeah, pick up the few asset races, chainsaws, then of course these were wrong, but no need to be self righteous about it and cast shadow over the entire Calgary fan base. Now, what the fuck is he saying, man? And this is Blaze Matudi too, getting racist abuse, I'm assuming, right? I'm happy with the abuse he's getting. Above it, very, very cool and calm. Got his goal. Well, there's several people inside the stadium. And he's a, Jesus a Christ, man. Look at Allegri there with Matuidi. Jesus Christ. Absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Man. Absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Absolutely disgusting. Look at this. And what are, what's the referee going to do? What's the referee doing? What's the referee going to do? What's he going to do? What's the referee going to do? Matuidi, it's like it's do absolutely disgusting. It. Absolutely disgusting. It's disgusting, isn't it? Across the public address system. But yeah, anyway, um, Mosey Keane answered in the best way possible. He scored the winning goal and celebrated like that. Well done, brother. Well done. Well done, man. But yeah, um, backwards nation doing backwards stuff. I shouldn't be that surprised anyway. I guess, you know, moving on in. Ba, 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 ba. What should we talk about here? Oh, these converse. Should we talk about the... Um, the end of DJ of DJ Snobbery. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's, let's talk about it. It's actually the controllers. Blow my nose. I always have excessive mucus because of my um, hay fever, <coughs> but then I don't like taking hay fever tablets because um, I've realised over the years that the only ones that work for me are the drowsy ones. The non-drowsies don't really work that well for me personally. They don't really have the best, um, I don't really have, they don't really resolve the issues. Um, but then, you know, working five days a week, going to the gym all the time, I can't afford to be taking um, normal kind of um, anti-allergy tablets because they're going to make me super drowsy and I won't be able to do the work that I need to do. So it's kind of a weird sort of like, you know, balancing act of just always having a fucking wet nose and taking a tablet and feeling fucking drowsy as fuck. So, Hence why my nose is always running. Anyway, this really this really interesting article popped up. Um, it's on DJ Mag and it's titled "We Need to End uh, um, Controller Snobbery," which kind of you know hits home for me because I, I play with a controller when I'm at a pub here in Westfield and Stratford for the most part every Friday, and then when I go and play in bars and clubs, I usually use um, their CDJs right and a USB drive, whatever. So I've been able. It's been quite good for me because. I've been able to practice quite often in a club setting, play with club a club setup, and I've also been able to do my own DJ thing at home with a controller, which is always handy. Because again, you know, to be able to afford a full kind of you know proper proper setup DJ setup would cost a lot of money, and I don't really have that at the moment. Um, um, a proper like you know CDJs. That, no, I think each CDJ two thousand, the proper ones with the USB are like a thousand one hundred, maybe a half fifteen hundred each or whatever. So you know, take a while for me to get that sort of thing. So. Um, DJ controls for always have always been a really always held a really special place in my heart because it allowed me to play music out loud, it allowed me to go play in places, get paid, get be able to play in gigs, and also allowed me to practice. And when I go to on a full DJ self, even though it's not the same thing, I still have the same sort of kind of I, I can practice my timing, right? 
I can I can beat match. All you can all you need to do is take off the kind of the 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 waveforms on the on the laptop you got setting. You can take those off and disable them so you can learn how to beat match and stuff. So there's things that you can learn playing on the controller that will help you playing in the DJ world. But um, a weird thing happened. I don't know when it happened. I think maybe because of the influx of DJ controllers at the time. I think there was a period when um. Maybe a couple of years ago, when all the budget DJ controls were coming out, Newmark were kind of crushing it and bringing out loads of DJ controls all the time. Really poor quality for the most part. And I think Pioneer hadn't really made any strides in that kind of um, segment segment uh, sector just yet, especially in the budget controller way. And it always seemed a bit like a toy kind of hobby thing. It never really was taken that seriously. But I think over the years, because the higher end stuff, the CDJs has gotten more expensive, right? Like I said mentioned before, like you know, even the DJM. 200 mixer it's like 250 right the the, the mixer that um the pioneer mixer that they make that kind of you can plug into a uh, usb drive and shit they're quite expensive so i think the fact that they've gone up i think the fact that um dj controllers of dj cdjs have gone up in price over the years and have gotten more sophisticated um has then made um the entry level dj controllers a bit more covetable because djs out there who kind of just want to practice and just want to have something to play about home are having to buy these little controllers just to kind of have something just to kind of run through tunes play things see how they are see how they sound out loud maybe put some cue points and stuff it's just a good thing to have at home and i think for most of the articles i've seen online of djs on the website called freud freud von freuden and maybe other kind of things like on electronic beats i've seen people like you know have interviews inside their apartments and stuff i've always seen I think I've seen a couple of DJs have like a setup where they have one deck only and they kind of use that as like something just to play songs out through a monitor or whatever maybe. Or I've seen them have a controller like I do, right? Um, which I have a, a Pioneer Serato, D, I don't know, Pioneer DJ, something, whatever. So um, the snobbery is kind of ended, I thought, but this kind of article kind of speaks on what happened and how it kind of uh, transpired. This is an article from DJ Mag, got up in the screen. Um, we need to end in, in DJ Snobbery. And it says the following. Da -da -da -da. Zoom in a little bit here. On your screen, yeah. zoom in a little bit there. Zoom in. Picture the scene. You're wrapping up an incredible set. Outstretched arms are begging for sweaty high fives from the uh, packed dance floor. Your plus ones grinning wildly, eyes darting from left to right, making sure everyone knows that they came with you. Lavender scented towel in hand, as requested. The floor, the club, nay, the world is yours. As you roll into the final mix, a perfect blend, of course. The next DJ has entered the booth. Fine, I guess. Reaching over your mixer, they inspect the ins and outs of the garnish with a garish iPhone light, ruining the sacred booth vibe which one can use. Which one can I use? They screech. They screech over the ear bleeding monitor. That's when you spot it. Your heart sinks. Your face contorts. This is a controller. Some kind of plastic device you don't catch the make. I'm willing to even acknowledge the culture travesty. Um, you do a 100% wet, you know, wet reverb effect. Raise your hands to applaud yourself and quickly squeeze out the booth to the green room. A wedding flock of hanger along follow fuck that it's a sorry tale that djs who would have taken a controller to the club are all too familiar with the looks and the tone they're discussed apart from the fact that it's slightly more inconvenient when somebody reaches over to swap out an rca cable mid-set surely controller djs don't deserve this we're not talking about complex hybrid live setups like the one richie lords or dubfire use we're talking about the simple two or four channel devices that mimic a simple mixing environment Techno snobbery is old as tech itself, from Mac to PC to iPhone to Android to Fender to Gibson to FL to Pro Studio to virtually as a tractor. There's always been a level of alliance, um, often dictated by whoever, wh wh whatever genre congregation you found yourself in. But when it comes to controllers and by associating laptops, there's more of a story than b blind allegiance, which is true, right? Because I think the issue with controllers isn't that it's not the iPhone and Android sort of thing, because I think with the controllers and CDJs, the issue with it or USB drives you know that kind of battle which is interesting how that's kind of shaped up over the years isn't it i remember back in the day like if you didn't come in a booth with a, a little flip you know what i used to do actually back in the day this is a kind of confession i used to bring my controller with me but i used to also bring my cds so i'd bring a, my little wallet of cds with me when i used to play back in the day and i'd kind of flick through my cds and i'd have like three or four tunes i can play straight away and then once the, the other djs out of the booth or they've kind of gave way i then bring out my controller and plug that in mid-set Again, super stupid and a lot more stressed than need be. But I just didn't want that awkwardness or that kind of look down snobbery of like, he's using a controller. So I'd have, kind of have to do that. Anyway, the cost of entry to DJ industry standard has always been high. A pair of 1210s and a competent two-channel mixer have, have, was always out of budget. It's true, isn't it, right? Just as the 5,000 plus you'd have to spend on a pair of CDJ uh, NX, NX's 2s and a DJM 900 mixer. Yeah, Jesus Christ. That's industry standard. It's five grand. 
Fucking hell. The way on a part-time job and pocket money of a young dance music fan who wants to DJ, get some DJ. This is true. Do a lot of DJs work part-time? I don't work fucking full-time, but just try and work around it. There's not enough money to work in part-time. But I guess for the most part, you work part-time because you want to dedicate all your time. Because I think if I work part-time, you'd have to be uploading mixes every day. That's one thing I've noticed too. There's not a lot of DJs that actually upload mixes quite a lot, is it? Except for the kind of music lot, there's not a lot of DJs that actually upload mixes regularly all the time. The kind of music lot always upload mixes. Like they always do radio shows and stuff. Like Adam Port's always kind of uploading stuff. But for the most part, DJs don't really upload. I guess if you're professional and you're already getting your book booked already, you don't really need to kind of um, solicit more more gigs. But I think, especially for myself, I'm kind of always kicking myself because I don't upload as many mixes as I should do. I should be uploading all the time, maybe every week. But anyway, um, it's maybe on a part time job and pocket money of a young dance music fan who wants to get into DJ. Um, of course, there's a fucking hallowed turf there. It's such a beautiful device, and I fucking love it. Um, so where do you start with with what 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 can you afford? And a piece of a crack DJ. No. So where do you start with what can you afford? A piece of crack DJ software. Don't do that. Um, which is true. I I I, I buy mine now. Crack software is fucking shit. It never works. Well, for me anyway. Um, and so I think it's like nine pound a month or something. I think if I buy it outright, it's a bit more cheaper. Um, are there ambitious? Are ambitious? Are there ambitious less less value? Less valid. Sorry. Speak to any DJ who started in, in Asia Vinyl and they'll tell you the crappy belt drive um, turntable that they had, which is the same thing I have, a Newmark one, right? Belongs to their parents, they learned to mix on and the cassette deck they blended tapes on um, in their host family's basement in Seattle. Uh, the late 80s. Okay, that's um, just Chris Liebling. As we hear these stories, um, there's a romanticism, a dedication, a drive to overcome the technical and financial barriers to express themselves and thrive to excel as DJ against the odds. So there, um, that was offensive, but controllers are inept. Not to mention that the creative connection we make with our with our equipment. There's a reason tech riders exist, and that's not just for convenience. Um, we develop muscle memory, a deep bond, and a familiarity in an unfamiliar setting. Whether it's an established DJ hoping for hopping from city to city, or a DJ playing uh, their first set in a jacked club, uh, for controller users, there's often shamed into making a transition to cdjs or equivalent equipment they've only ever seen or touched while hundreds of thousands of people are standing in front of them they're very nuanced more move translated through a ten thousand pound sound system no pressure of course um it got much better in front in recent times to facilitate this transition pioneer dj's introduction of record box somewhat eases the move to home to booth meaning all the familiar cue points loop points and playlists are mirrored in the, in the fancy setup even pioneer dj's more affordable controller attempts to mimic the layout of the flagship nx2 which is true all of that is goes over the fact that cdj's and equivalent of control are not controller purpose-built units playing digital files controlling bespoke os try and actually use a smartphone and a controller to dj though and see what looks get you get the console DC DJ and everything else. Uh, anyway, the control the article too is a really good article. I recommend you check it out. My forced opinions on it are as follows, right? I think in the beginning when I started to DJ, um, there was this idea that um the equipment was what made you, right? Equipment was best. And I think I was it kind of mimicked the YouTube era where everyone kept asking about people's cameras, right? So that was the era when every vlogger I think it still happens now, I'm not really sure, I don't really watch vlogs that much, but every vlogger back in the day, um um on youtube when you have make a youtube channel you've got your default upload i think a description thing like sitting underneath the video so you can kind of uh write the you know you have your your default things you want to write like your social media links whatever it may be called right and i remember most vloggers used to have like a breakdown of what equipment they use are what camera i use are because it's the kind of constant question you get all the time and there was this thinking i don't know why but there was a thinking behind people that were creating and people that were watching that the camera was what made those stories interesting was what made the vlogger interesting um, the equipment they use is what made this DJ the best, right? What mixer is that? What's that? What's that effects thing? And then I think over time, I'm not sure why it happened uh, exactly, what the what the cultural shift was, but it actually changed and it kind of felt, it kind of evolved into the era of selectors, right? So we're seeing DJs more of like, it doesn't matter what they play or how they mix. It's actually the tunes that they play. No, sorry, it's, it's not how they mix or what equipment they use. It's the tunes that they play at a given specific time. And that's where I've, maybe I kind of started falling in love with DJ Harvey, and Ricardo Villalobos. Um, those are kind of DJ, or even a Seth Truckster, who at the time people would just say he wasn't the most technically proficient DJ, but he had such an eclectic and great taste in music, right? Because of his history uh, growing up in Detroit, work, working in a record store. His parents have got a musical background. He's been making, he's been DJing for, you know, umpteen years. He started really, really young. Um, so he, they just had a different kind of way of interpreting records. Uh, uh, 
Ben UFO is another good example. Um, uh, Scream is another one. Maybe he's a, you know because he's a professional DJ too. But people that were selectors more so. And then I think with that also came the uh, also came it, it paralleled you know the cost of CDJs going rocketing up right they skyrocket now now you know an NX a, a Pioneer CDJ NX two is like I don't know two grand plus whatever it may be so then when those um when that kind of happened I think Pioneer and those other established brands kind of saw a gap in the market for DJs who were established but just didn't want to spend that much amount of money on a CDJ. And now you have those um, RX units, right, which are like 1,500. They kind of um, are a big controller with like two CDJs um, attached to it. And then and then you have the level that I have just below it, which is a Pioneer CD controller, has all the elements that you're familiar with with a Pioneer setup, but it's just in a more compact unit. and But it's got a kind of robust um, a professional feel that you expect from Pioneer. And they've kind of aimed that towards, of course, bedroom DJs, but more so for DJs who just want to practice at home. And I think for the most part, the customers too have also realized that it doesn't really matter what the person plays with, as long as they kind of rock the club, everyone's down with it. I don't really, I don't really see as many chin strokers as I used to see back in the day. Before you would go to a club and you'd see a whole bevy of men, usually men just standing on the side of the walls, like just, you know, uh, dancing minimally, but more so critiquing the DJ's mix. So, so much so there'll be someone da- dancing right at the front of the booth, just staring at the DJ and looking at how they play, how they mix, like left and right, like looking what knobs they move around. Really bizarre for me, isn't it? Because obviously I've grown, I would class myself as a club kid, right? I actually go clubbing, like I'm considering, I'm even considering going to Berlin, I think at the end of June, to go to the Bergheim and go see some DJs play. Like I'm an actual club kid, I go and see DJs play, I don't care where the DJ is, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bothered about going to the, near the booth, I just want to dance and have a good time and, and fucking enjoy myself, I don't care about and all of that kind of like, you know, standing right in front of the booth shit. So I never really got that idea, but it does exist. But I think now there's a rule, it's kind of got better and people are a little bit more understanding that the equipment isn't the issue, it's how kind of people conduct themselves. Now, of course, that whole transition when you when DJ's playing their last song and you're coming in, there is etiquette that goes with it, right? I remember um, DJ non compliant talking about it on an RA podcast where you kind of, you know, it's a kind of faux pas to kind of go into the booth and mix the other song. You don't need to do that. Just let the song play out. Um, you know, transition that way properly, let it end properly. I think that's that's the kind of Berlin way that I've kind of learned, right? Of the actually letting that tune play out, clapping for the person, and then have and then you start in a fresh. I think it's nice too for the crowd. I think there was this idea that the crowd you can't have it silent, right? It's coming, it's coming. No, it's alright to be silent. They know they know I'm starting. It's alright to start again. They know I'm starting. A new person. They're not going to suddenly now go home. They know it's another person coming. They see me. I'm setting up. I'm another person. I'm new. I gave you a hug. They can see that I'm another DJ coming in. It's okay to kind of let it let it kind of simmer down and start again. But I think overall, I've, I think I've realized, I think I've shown, especially with the stuff that I've been doing, with playing in this pub that I'm playing in Westfield Tapis. Come next week, I'm playing there, April twelfth. Um, I've kind of given myself a challenge to not use the equipment just as like a play, pause and play um, a gizmo. I kind of push myself when I'm using a controller because it's easier to use because I've got a laptop, I've got like a screen, a big interface I can use. There's, there's loads of cheat codes because it's an automatic loop function with um, two bar, four bar, six bar, eight bar loops already there. So I try to use the, I try to stretch the capability. I don't just try and mix like left and right, left and right, right, left, right, left. I try to stretch as much as I can so that I can get creative with that. So the hope is that when I then go and use CDJs in a nightclub, I can then bring that same creativity to that kind of platform. But I want to try and stretch the possibilities of that kind of little controller so that people listening can see, ah, oh, he's just standing there pausing and playing. Because that's the annoying thing about it when people just, you know, they have their Serato face staring at the screen. I'm, I just want to have my playlist ready. Like I do, I do stuff that probably a lot of DJs don't do when they use controllers. I prepare a playlist. I put crates together. Um, I, I separate my tunes. I know I'm going to play maybe the first half an hour and then the rest of it I freestyle. I don't look at the screen too often. I play what's on the fucking um, controller base. Like those are little things that I kind of use in order to kind of give myself a little bit more of an edge of the people that use it um, by and large. But I think, by and large, I think that snobbery has ended. I think if you're a DJ out there, I think you should mostly concentrate on your selection and making sure that you've got like a really interesting, you've got a really interesting thing to say for your music. I think for the most part, that's what's made me a fan of DJs when I go, for instance, I always talk about them all the time, but I've mentioned them again. Dr. Rubenstein and Roy Perez, uh, they're one of my recent DJ discoveries. And why I'm a big fan of them is that like, because they're just full of surprises, right? They've, cut, they've got their own little flavor of how they play um it's a particular sort of vibe um i'll take it similar to like a solomon right that's the reason why people love solomon because his personality seeps through his dj set you know exactly his him right it's a very particular way of playing and i fucking love it and that's something i kind of want to do going forward um yeah so that's my
point on DJs. I think, again, these nobody is fucking prophetic anyway. I think, in general, good DJs are good DJs regardless of what they use. Um, same with the camera thing. It doesn't really matter what camera you use. Good storyteller is a good storyteller. And that's it. Constantly, I'm actually telling a good story. People that actually... Telling the story people give a shit about and then the rest will sort of kind of follow. I think, anyway, in my opinion. Moving on in, moving on up. What do we have here? We have a Converse and Soloist ERX 2000 or something like that, right? Is it 260? It's still in stock, surprisingly. Weird. Um, no, nice shoe, right? So um, this shoe came, I think, when it came out? A couple of weeks ago? A couple of months ago, maybe? Um, I'm a big fan of it. I didn't see any hype about it. I don't know why this wasn't featured anywhere. I'm not sure if this something was on the runway. I haven't, le- I haven't necessarily seen the runway uh, or a collection or presentation of Soloist maybe since 2017, 2016. It was a really cool collection that I like. They had this... They had these amazing sort of like bulletproof um, vest, kind of like gun vest sort of thing that he did with these um, Chelsea boots that had the zip at the back, right? Similar to like a Goody. Is it Goody? Goody, that kind of brand. I forgot that brand, what it's name. It had a massive, chunky um, silver zip at the back. Really good collection. But then I remember looking at through Japanese sites and I've seen like, you know, some of the shoes only go up to 42 and shit. It's just, it's annoying because it's a real, it's a, it's a real Japanese brand. No, there's some Japanese brands that get bought by European buy- European buyers or European stores, and then they start, you know, changing their sizes and whatever it may be. Um, I don't think Soloist has been picked up by that many um, European retailers or North American retailers, so you're still getting that core Japanese sizing where, you know, an XL is probably a medium. The, the shoes don't go above a size 9. It's all fucking annoying shit. Um, I wish it did because I'd love to wear some, most of the stuff, but if, for me, it's like a real, it's like, for me, it's like a more, um, a little bit more of a sinister Haida Aikerman. A little bit more edgy, right? It's like the brother, like they're two brothers. Hyde Aikerman's a kind of smooth, polished guy, and then Soloist uh, Takeri Takahara Miyamoto, whatever you pronounce his name, um, is a little bit more of an edgy one, right? Miyashita, Miya Taki, 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 Ma- oh, I don't even pronounce it. Anyway, um, this is the shoe. Converse Soloist ERX2. I think Converse are kind of heading into the sneaker size of it because I know they've been doing a lot of collaborations. There's a new um, off white, no, so there's a new um, golf wine shoe coming out recently that I saw Tyler uh, promoting on his Twitter. Uh, faux leather, a faux croc sort of collection. Um, there's obviously the tons of other ones. There's ones that ASAP Nasty that are fucking awesome. ASAP Nasty from um, ASAP Mob did a really good shoe. But I'm really a big fan of this one, actually. This Converse. Um, RX2. I'm not sure if they're going to do more of these going forward. I'm not sure if this is like a one-off or if this is something that they're just doing specifically for com- for um, the soloist, but it looks fucking awesome. And again, I've not seen anyone talk about these online. I'm not sure if this is something that I'm kind of missing out on or I'm sure other people have been speaking about it, but I've not seen anyone talking about it. And I think this is this is, this is my point that when it comes to like, you know, uh, sneaker buying for the most part, when it comes to sneakerheads in the industry, it always kind of feels like to me for the most part, they're all buying the same shit, right? There's not really any sort of ingenuity when it comes to sneakers people kind of go for things that don't really that a lot not a lot of people are buying or it's not really that hype but if i was a sneakerhead if i was really involved in the game these are the things that i can be wanting to buy like this is something a little bit more interesting look at look how cool this looks it's got like a zip on the front it's got an ice clear sole it looks fucking great like this is something that would be way up my alley and again the size is it's not too bad actually they're still in stock got my size 130 quid with a massive sort of zip on the front of it i really like it i am um, the something I don't I, I love it. You love to get a pair. They're one of my favorite shoes I've seen as of late. Again, I've not seen anyone mention previously um, the words there, backwards underneath. But yeah, I'm a big fan of these. Um, I'm not sure if that's an actual original shoe. It must be an original retro that they just put that in their own color, right? ERX 260. It looks really cool for me personally. I'm a big fan of it. Um, again, I love the zip on the front of it. It reminds me kind of like a mastermind shoe. That's what mastermind would probably end up doing. A leather with a bit of new buck, all black. You know, I'm a sucker for an all black sneaker. Anyone that knows me knows. I love all black shoes. I'm a kind of guy that wears all black Air Forces now, even though I don't, I'm not a fucking, you know, road goon or whatever it may be called. But yeah, I'm a big fan of these. They're available now on Dover Street Market. Check them out. Uh, Converse Solomon ERX, ERX 260. Um, again, only £130. Pound. The only size out of stock is a size 8. Again, I'm surprised these shoes are still available. They're so nice, man. It'd be an easy way to kind of just get the solo with stuff in your in your wardrobe. And again, I think they're wax laces too, are they? No, they're not. They're just regular red laces. But yeah, big fan of these. Look fucking awesome and i'm hoping converse do a lot more of these shoes going forward um um i think because again the one stars are great but again for someone like me with my massive fucking wide feet my feet are getting better now because i'm working out a lot and i'm working on kind of you know um, developing the arch of my foot by working out in really flat trainers 
by running on the balls of my feet, by squatting with my feet pointed. But still, you know, my feet are wide. I can't really deny that sort of um, absolute fact. Um, but yeah, overall, um, Dover Street Market have all the nice goods there. Are these Junior Watanabe New Balances? Interesting. What do they do with these then? So there's a Junior Watanabe New Balances. Is there any sort of particular detail that they've added towards them or they just look standard New Balances? Okay. Hmm. They look quite nice though, innit, right? I'm going to put this up on the screen here. Yeah, these are Junior Watanabe New Balances 574s, £150. New Balances are always... I think New Balances have done a good thing with pricing, right? I think because... I looked at the other day, like Yeezys, right? Yeezy 700 is my my favorite. The V two, the V twos, they're like two fifty, aren't they? Retail, which is quite expensive for retail in terms of a, just a regular trainer to wear, right? Um, but I guess you know they're really well made. It's a particular, it's a particular range, the the Yeezy range. Um, they're not many of those made in general. You're buying into something, blah 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 blah. But I think New Balance has done a really good way, a really good thing in their pricing because it's always consistent, right? It's, it's very rare you can find a New Balance for under hundred pounds, isn't it, or ninety quid or something? It doesn't really exist, I don't think, for the most part. Most New Balances are hundred quid plus, and you know you're more than happy to pay it because you know what you're going to get, right? You're getting you're getting your value for money for the most part. Um, and again, I think these look really good. I'm not sure what they. Junior Watanabe sneakers, six eyelet, um, logo patch, tongue, logo patch. What? You take it off now. What's the? What is it? So is outer leather. I think. What is that? What kind of leather is that? That tumble looks really nice, actually. Off white sort of laces. It's quite nice to be honest. I'm not gonna lie. They're they're quite nice. Um, there's eye on the back of it, so there's no obvious new what's now be branding except for the thing on the back tab. Again, for you know, some people like those collaboration with like you know they scream what the branding is on the back of it. But I quite like what these look like. Actually, junior what's now be five seven four. They look quite nice, and they come in white too. Yeah, those really, they don't really exist. Even these shoes, you'd probably think they'd be. Uh, the New Balance C CT four hundred. You think they'd be under ninety quid because they look a bit more simple and they're kind of a vulcanized sole, but yeah, they don't really exist. There is no such thing as an under one hundred quid um, New Balance. These all white ones are fucking nice, man. They're hard. Yeah, these all white ones are really really nice. But yeah, um, loads of nice sneakers on the whole Dover Street market. You feel to check out. Um, I haven't bought anything in Dover Street in a while, man. I can't. I, I can't wait for that sale to happen again. I think I'm gonna just save money. If they have one of those Com Com de Garçon sales again, like some of the shirts I was able to buy, man, I still wear them to this day, man. The Com de Garçon shirt, um, Com de Garçon um, shirt, uh, home um, shirt stuff. It's just really, really nice. Some, some of the shirts, like I've, I, I can't believe I didn't buy more of the trousers and stuff and more of the jackets and trainers. Really, and I really actually regret, I had some plimsolls that I had from that collection that I regret giving away. But you know, when you're in dire straits you have to kind of do what you got to do in that regard um what else do we talk about here let's have a look at the, the old hype of the beast see if i miss anything that i want to talk about before we jet off ba, 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 ba. hurry up i actually got some easy 700s coming in actually soon um i bought the brown ones um they should be coming in soon i think they're shipping actually next week they should be absolutely amazing um oh heron preston's got a 720 i want to see this this is cool so Heron Preston has got this is a live. Let's see, live reaction, live, live, live reaction. Heron Preston debuts uh, to debut a Nike Air Max Seven Twenty Nine Ninety Five. Oh, okay, he 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 um fused them together. Fucking yeah, man, this guy's going for it, isn't it. Well done, Heron Preston, brother. Ooh, I quite like that, man. That looks fucking gnarly, isn't it? I wonder if something. And again, I don't know how these collaborations work out. I wonder if this is something that he did himself. Or if it was a model that Nike wanted to do and they asked Heron to design the colorway. Because I don't know, because sometimes they do that Nike nowadays, right? In order to introduce like a new shoe that's a bit more risque, something that they're not sure people are, are going to like, they'll tap a designer, they'll tap a brand in and kind of get them to put their stamp on it and then they'll introduce it to, to uh, the market. Um, the first thing I can think of is maybe the Nike React 87s. If my memory serves me correct, the first colorway we ever saw was the undercover versions, right? But then the first version that came out was a retail version, isn't it? I think it went that way. It went, it, it went the undercover version we saw on the runway and then the sale and the black colorways came out first. So it was kind of a way to kind of ease them into the kind of um, the current uh, retail cycle. But these look fucking hard. These look really nice. I wasn't a fan of the Fusions. I think, um, didn't Pat do one recently? They did like a Nike BW on a 95 Soul. I wasn't really a fan of that. But I like this 95 upper with the 720 sole because the 720 sole is fucking, for me, it's amazing. I love the massive bubble all over it. And all the, look, it's like five swooshes all over it covered. And it's like, you know, the quintessential hair impression, safety orange colors. They look really fucking cool. What does it say to you in the description here? Um, hair impression says, um, get the chance to participate 
in the MX customization workshops during the Milan Design Fashion Week. Nike studio hosted by Antonelli. Register now on the sto- on on story or on here. Okay, awesome man. Well done, dude, man. He's fucking smashing it, isn't it? Really, really good. It's really it's been a good kind of year or two for Harry Preston. But yeah, so you got here a cut a pink one that's probably gonna come out and orange ones. They look really nice. Maybe nice level together. I really like them, man. They look fucking awesome. I'm sure there might be some apparel too. He then and again, I think he did it in a good way. Instead of I think he mentioned the interview, instead of going straight for the shoe, he designed the what did he do? He made those, you know, Oh, he, he kind of done those um, DIY Air Forces with the kind of tabs on them, with the sellotape, I think with the duct tape that he put he put out. And then he decided to put glasses out first. And then when he did the glasses, then he decided to put the shoes out, which kind of I think is, again, an interesting way of introducing your brand overall. I'm sure there'll be apparel tied into it. But again, this is the first look at these 729.95s. They look fucking awesome. I guess they're going to be launched during a design fashion, Milan Design Fashion Week, which again ties in nicely with Nike trying to kind of, you know, move or move in different sort of sectors so just operating in a whole completely sneakerhead um convention way maybe moving into the design world and they look really heavily heavily designed i'm not sure what even my material that is it looks fucking cool i'm a big fan of them i can't wait to see what they look like in person anyway that's an hour we are done i'm out of here Thank you for tuning into the Agostino Zinger Show, episode number 174, with me, your host, Agostino Zinger. This is the end of the week. Um, I'll see you guys again next week. For all information regarding me, check out my website, zinger.com. If you're out and about, um, go see my friends play on Friday. This is today at the um, uh, Tap East for my night called Tapped. It'll be um, Natalia, probably alongside uh, Karina, another girl that's usually covers for me. I'll be back at Tapped next week on Friday, the 12th of April. And then I'm playing, uh, actually, I'm playing on Saturday. This Saturday, he've come and staff my night called um, La Betis. So if you're in the area, come and hang out and do that um tonight i'm going to see drake tonight i'm going to see drake 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 at the o2 for the assassination vacation tour um if you're there and you see me say hi drake is playing at o2 arena i can't wait i can't wait it should be fucking awesome but until then hope you i hope you all enjoy your weekend and you have a great safe weekend for everyone um say you love say say i love you to the people that are nearest and dearest to you hold them dear and take and be safe Make sure you stay on your P's and Q's. Look left and right. That's Sergio Busquets, not like Scott Parker. And I hope to see you again very, very soon. Take care, everybody. Bye.